you know when people say like I need a cup of coffee that's as big as my head like this is literally as big as my head and I need it today hello everybody welcome back to my channel and thank you for joining me for another true crime deep dive this is part two of the case we're covering right now so if you haven't seen part one yet i've linked it in the description box and you should definitely watch that first because one comes before two for a reason now there's way too much in part one to recap but today we're talking about the build-up to the murder of susan reinhardt an english teacher at upper marion high school in pennsylvania and the disappearance of her two children, 11-year-old Karen and 10-year-old Michael. We spent a lot of time in part one talking about Bill Bradfield, the head of the English department at Upper Marion, his relationship with many different women, including other faculty members and students, and how he and Susan Reynard became entangled. Today, we're talking about another main character, the principal of Upper Marion High School, a man named J.C. Smith. And trust me, if you thought Bill was an odd guy, you ain't seen nothing yet. Before we dive right in, let's have a word from the sponsor of today's video, Magellan TV. Magellan TV is the place to go to stream amazing documentary films and series. With over 3,000 titles available and more being added every single week, there's sure to be more than enough for everyone on Magellan TV. Whether you're interested in true crime, science, nature, history, or really anything else, Magellan TV brings you education as well as entertainment, and it is television worth watching. I have a great recommendation for those of you who are already watching Magellan TV or those of you who want to try it. It's a series called Cyber Crimes with Ben Hammersley. There's six episodes. Magellan TV was built by documentary filmmakers who share your passion for gripping true stories, and you can watch it anytime, anywhere. Magellan TV is available on iOS and Android. You can watch it on your phone, tablet, computer, smart TV, Roku, Amazon Fire TV, and so much more. Magellan TV is my go-to when I'm putting on makeup in the morning and I want something to just play on my cell phone or, you know, when I just want to isolate myself from this world and lose myself in another world. I love the From Above series on Magellan. I've raved about these films before. They're just beautiful and, and such a great distraction from everything ugly about the world because everything looks way better from thousands of feet up. I know so many of you already are watching Magellan TV because I chat with a lot lot of people about what you're watching and what you think about it but if you don't have Magellan TV yet now is as good a time as any to sign up as Magellan TV is offering viewers of my channel 30% off an annual membership which will give you an entire year for less than three dollars and fifty cents a month simply click the link in the description box to redeem the special offer today thank you so much to Magellan TV for sponsoring today's video and let's dive in Okay, so J.C. Smith came to Upper Marion High School in the fall of 1966 to serve as the school's principal. He was 37 years old at the time and a colonel in the Army Reserves with aspirations to become a general at some point in his military career. Right from the start, everyone at the school found him to be very different. So you know how everyone loved Bill Bradfield and everyone just couldn't get enough of him and everyone thought he was just the greatest? It's the exact opposite with J.C. Smith. On the first day of school, he wore his full army uniform and he paced around the halls in his normal way, as if he were walking drills, erect, poised, purposeful. After that day, he always wore black suits, but sometimes the suits would appear to be ill-fitting, a detail that his secretary, Ida Machucci, asked him about. Jay told Ida that he only bought his clothes from the Salvation Army, and that was the end of the conversation. He was six foot two, his dark hair was receding prematurely, and he was described as having waxy-like skin. He didn't technically stand out, but the one thing those who crossed his path could never forget were his eyes. No one could agree on how to describe these eyes. His secretary, Ida, said, quote, You've never seen such a pair of eyes in all your life. There was no feeling in them. You might think you've known a few people with cold fish eyes, but not like his, end quote. 
Others referred to Jay's eyes as reptilian, but in the book Echoes of Darkness, written by Joseph Wambaugh, Jay's eyes were described differently. The book says, quote, not fish, not reptiles, though the eyes were very lightly lashed and a bit hooded. But at certain times, in his more sardonic moments, when the eyebrows lifted to form two perfect S's across his high forehead, in those moments, the irises slid back and his eyes were tartar and tilted. And if you simply elongated the pupils, gave them a vertical squeeze in your imagination, it was abundantly clear that Dr. J.C. Smith had the eyes of a goat, end quote. Ida said that when her new boss started, it took a full week for him to come and introduce himself to her. From the start of his new role as principal, J.C. Smith confused everyone around him. He would come to work for the day, but then he would disappear for hours and no one could find him, even though they really tried. Later, he would show back up, walk briskly into his office, and shut the door, locking it with no explanation to all the people who had been trying to track him down throughout the day. Jay Smith made it clear to Ida that he did not want anyone knocking on his door or bothering him unless it was absolutely urgent, and he did this every single day. Ida remembered that very few people were willing to stand up to him, however, and tell him when he was out of line, but she would every so often, especially when he would put army paperwork on her desk and ask her to type it up for him. Ida would coolly tell him that she was far too busy with her actual work for the school to work on his personal stuff. It does seem without a doubt that J.C. Smith was an intelligent man. So where Bill Bradfield appeared to be intelligent, where he convinced people he was intelligent, I truly believe J.C. Smith was intelligent and Bill Bradfield was just kind of like, an imposter. Jay Smith read a lot and very quickly. He could memorize whole portions of books. He'd also memorized the school yearbook and he would shock students when he'd address them by their names even though they'd never met him before just because he recognized them on sight from memorizing their pictures and names from the yearbook. Jay Smith was known to have a nice speaking voice. He had a talent with words and a large vocabulary, but he would often use this vocabulary to confuse and throw off other people, especially the teachers at his school, since he rarely wanted to be disturbed by them and he really wanted to deter the teachers from bothering him with what he considered unimportant and mundane matters that were beneath his high status. One of the teachers that Jay Smith seemed to have a great dislike for, at least initially, was the head of the English department, Bill Bradfield. It seemed that Jay Smith had a tendency of giving teachers notices, basically like disciplinary warnings, but they were always for stupid things, like nothing that actually they should have been disciplined for, but things that they shouldn't have been disciplined for. And Bill, as the representative for the teachers, he would be responsible for bringing their grievances to the principal when they felt they had gotten a notice unfairly. On one of these occasions, Jay Smith listened to Bill's issue and then coolly responded that he found his reasoning to be periphrastic. But Bill didn't know what that word meant, which probably drove him crazy because he considered himself the most intelligent and handsome man to ever walk the earth. So Bill had to run out of the principal's office so he could look up the word and then productively respond to it. But by the time he would come back, Jay Smith had disappeared again and no one could find him. So it was kind of like a distraction that Jay Smith used. Jay's secretary, Ida, said that he would sometimes just make up words that didn't exist. And then he would laugh and tell Ida that the person he said it to would never figure out what it meant because it wasn't a real word. He told her that these teachers, these pseudo-intellectuals, needed the exercise, the mental exercise that he provided. One time, Ida herself got a disciplinary notice from Jay Smith, and she was livid because Jay Smith was in his 30s, Ida was in her 50s, she'd been at the school for years, she'd never gotten into trouble, he shows up, all of a sudden he's changing everything. So she marched into her boss's office and asked him to explain himself, to which he responded that she'd been given a warning because he didn't like that she brought in candy every day and put it on her desk since it encouraged teachers and staff to loiter around the principal's office office and he didn't want them there. In the book, Principal Suspect, written by William C. Kostopoulos, it is said that Upper Marion High School 
flourished under the direction of J.C. Smith. Now, there's two things we need to keep in mind here. First, Kostopoulos was one of Smith's attorneys later on. And second, that is a very different story than the one every other single person had to tell. J. Smith turned the school upside down. Like, he he came in and just threw out the rule book and wrote his own in, like, invisible ink that nobody had the key to. He was known to bring his garbage from his house to the school and throw it out in the school's dumpster, and the custodians would often see him at the school late at night after everyone had left for the day. One night, they saw him leave his office and stroll to the bathroom wearing only his underwear. Jay Smith spent a lot of time in the bathroom during the school day, too, washing his hands. It became a running joke at the school because he could be found in a bathroom 15 to 20 times a day, scrubbing at his hands. There were also multiple reports of a strange smell coming from his office all the time. His secretary, Ida, described the smell as chemical or medicinal, but it was constant. And Ida was always taking calls for J. Smith from multiple strange women who would leave these cryptic messages for him. In his role as principal, J. Smith was responsible for interviewing and hiring new faculty and staff, and he had a way of making people uncomfortable, which he seemed to enjoy. So I think he did it on purpose. He liked to uh, shock people. He liked to say things that would embarrass people or shock people I think just to like see their reaction or feel some sort of power, some control that he was able to elicit a reaction in them. He asked one prospective teacher what kind of birth control she used. He asked another interviewee to explain how she handled her sex life. And remember Vincent Velatis, Bill Bradfield's little protege? Well, Jay Smith interviewed and hired him, but not before telling him, quote, Young man, just remember one thing. English literature is nothing more than effing and sucking, end quote. Of course, he did not say effing, but, you know, I am a lady. Since Jay didn't want to be bothered by the day-to-day workings of the school, the teachers soon figured out that they could do pretty much anything they wanted, and no one adapted to this new freedom more easily and more quickly than free-spirited epic poet Bill Bradfield. There was no longer a dress code, at least not one that was enforced, for students or faculty, and Bill started showing up to school in sneakers and like puffy vests and... He started growing his beard. Like, it was at this point that he let his beard grow wild, and he started really looking like Rasputin, which was his nickname. Jay Smith also took to getting on the school's PA to make announcements. I don't know if schools have PAs anymore, but back in my day, you know, like in the morning, they would do the school announcements and the Pledge of Allegiance and all of that stuff over the PA. And usually that would take about, like, 10 minutes in the morning, right? But J.C. Smith's control of the PA turned into rambling monologues that sometimes lasted all of first period. And as the years went on, they got even longer, cutting into second period. In the book Echoes in the Darkness, we're given an example of one of these speeches. Apparently, Jay Smith would say, this is your principal speaking. There is a new regulation for gym clothes. You may wear yellow bottoms and blue tops, or you may wear blue bottoms and yellow tops. I trust that this will please authoritarians in the faculty and displease libertarians, but I have one caveat. In the winter, it shall be the duty of each and every student to be encased in warm underwear. (laughs) Why do I get the impression of like a creepy Dr. Seuss? <laughs> yellow tops or blue bottoms? Blue bottoms or yellow tops? Whatever you want. Red fish, blue fish, one fish, two fish. <laughs> so yeah, he was he was running wild. And the brave teachers who would bring their grievances to Jay Smith would be abruptly shut down. One teacher complained to him that some of the students were like racing cars in the parking lot and sunbathing on the roofs of their cars because at this point, like the students were basically doing whatever they wanted. Jay Smith responded that he didn't have the time for the overreactions of a menopausal woman. Another time, Ida told him that the students were smoking weed on school property, and Jay said to her, what do you want me to do, Ida? Kill them? (laughs) We talked last... (laughs) I'm sorry. It's just ridiculous. Like, could you imagine a principal saying that? Like, the secretary's like, listen, these kids are smoking weed. And he's like, what am I supposed to do about it? Kill them? 
We talked last time about how Bill Bradfield had gotten himself the nickname Rasputin, while Jay Smith also had his own nickname given to him by Vincent Valetis. Jay Smith was always disappearing. There were rumors that he was walking around the school in his underwear at night, and some of the faculty giggled behind closed doors that he probably hung upside down in the boiler room during the day when no one could find him, like a bat who could transform into a vampire at any moment. One day, Vince and a couple other teachers were standing in the hall, you know, watching as the students left for the day, when Jay Smith walked out into the hall, shrugging into his long black overcoat. The strange thing about this picture was the fact that a large cloud of steam had gathered around his feet from a radiator leak. Now remember, Vince, he was into horror movies, especially like the older gothic ones, the silent black and white ones. So he turned to his fellow teachers and he whispered, now I know who he is. Alive and well in Upper Marion, that, my friend, is the Prince of Darkness. Jay Smith was a private man who kept to himself, but once a year he would attend a faculty party here or there. At one of these parties that he decided to grace his staff with his presence, he acted creepy AF as usual. The party was at the home of a female teacher who had been taking belly dancing lessons and after a few drinks, she decided to put on her costume and showcase some of her new skills. While this was happening, Jay Smith got real close up behind two other female teachers. They said they could feel his breath on their necks and he whispered, what does one do when a portion of one's anatomy gets hard? Now, you may be convinced that a figure like J.C. Smith would probably be a lifelong bachelor. He would have no time or care to include a family into his life, and who could honestly put up with him for an extended period of time? But in fact, he was married, and he and his wife had two daughters together. They all lived together on West Valley Forge Road in King of Prussia, Pennsylvania, and for the most part, everyone really liked Jay's wife, Stephanie, who was bubbly and outgoing. She called everyone Han. You know, she was like vivacious, curvaceous. She worked at a local laundromat. She was voluptuous. She liked to dress in a way where she would be noticed. And she was an open book to anyone who took the opportunity to have a little chat with her. Both Jay and Stephanie had grown up poor, and she'd worked several jobs throughout her youth to put her husband through college. They had two daughters. The oldest was also named Stephanie, and the younger was Sherry. Stephanie had attended Upper Marion High School for a short time, and during that time, Ida, Jay's secretary, had gotten to know her. So it was no secret that Stephanie, the daughter, had a drug problem. And Ida felt sorry for her, but she also was like, you know, J.C. Smith is her father, so it makes sense. Stephanie Smith, Jay's wife, was also not shy when talking to Ida, Jay's secretary, about her issues with her husband. It started out as just like juicy gossip between two women. Stephanie told Ida that Jay always kept the basement in their house locked and he wouldn't let anyone down there, even her or his daughters. But she'd broken in and found letters that Jay had been writing to other women. And Ida wasn't super surprised by this because remember, she was Jay's secretary. She's always fielding phone calls from different women and taking down these cryptic messages from these women to J.C. Smith. During another covert mission to the basement, Stephanie had found a swingers magazine, and one page had been marked. On this page, a couple was shown um, with their backs to the cameras, and it was basically a personal ad. So essentially, the couple pictured was soliciting messages to their P.O. box from anyone who wanted to share their bed and bodies. But even though the man in the picture was wearing only boxer shorts and had his back to the camera, Stephanie was 100% sure that it was her husband, Jay. Stephanie also found letters to other women, and she pocketed one to show one of her friends and coworkers. Okay, so these letters are e- even worse than the one from Susan to Bill. Way worse. But I'm going to read some parts of them to you so that you understand what kind of individual we're dealing with in J.C. Smith, like what kind of situation this really is. And I'm going to probably blush and be embarrassed, but I'm going <laughs> to do it. So one letter is addressed to Love Woman, and Jay writes, quote, We've been working, loving, effing, and smoking for over a year now, and I thought on your graduation a status report is in order. As we agreed, our relationship is sexual. I love your... Oh, no, I can't do it. <laughs> I can't. Like, I, when I wrote this, I was like, I'll be able to say this, but <laughs> let's try again. 
I love your bee jobs and get red hot seeing my C in your mouth. <laughs> the letter just gets real dirty from there. Like, it was dirty already. It, it gets worse. And I know you're all probably adults here, but I don't want to offend anyone, right? Because I feel that reading some of these passages out loud would almost be like either sexual harassment or like porn at this point. So it's just real spicy, real spicy. I can't even, I wish I could read them to you. But I, I don't feel like YouTube would like that. And I feel like there's, you know, definitely people out there who are going to be clutching their pearls and like, what? We didn't ask for this. So we're not going to do it. But anyway, he signed this letter. I can't even tell you what he signed the letter. Your love C forever. You know what C stands for, right? And then he talks about how he got some special cocoa butter so that a specific portion of this woman's body would not be sore. And it's a portion of the woman's body that is on her backside. Okay, okay. In another letter, he wrote, quote, No matter what we've done, I still love your bee jobs the best and get red hot looking in the mirror watching my blank go in and out of your... I can't do it. Okay. Um, he says something about love juice dripping down chins and when the, the love woman says good to the last drop in her southern accent, he throbs about 10 extra times. And if you thought that was explicit, you would absolutely blush to your toes to the next paragraph, which I cannot read. But then he goes on to say, quote, we share sex only with ourselves. No two timing. I don't count our spouses, but nobody else. I'm not like your husband. So if you F around on me, I'll beat your ass instead of effing it. Really? <laughs> so Jay goes on to say that he does not want to marry this woman, even though he loves her more than any woman, with the exception of his wife, who he has a special love for, so she doesn't count. I guess that's sweet. Jay also tells this woman that she should level with her husband, saying, quote, Even if you say he's a mama's boy, he should accept the situation. You told him about you and your brother, and he still married you. Incidentally, if you go down south, don't go out alone with your brother, end quote. <laughs> This is ridiculous. I'm not going to read the rest because it's sick. But basically, Jay's telling this woman not to keep teasing her brother sexually because then she will have to have sex with her brother again. And he says, your husband forgave you once. I won't. No brother sex, period. <laughs> I'm like crying here. Like My mascara is going to be all over my face. And then Jay says that this woman's husband should join them in their sex stuff and that his wife would be open to it as well. Okay, Stephanie Smith was not open to it. She knew who Love Woman was, the wife of a college professor that she'd met, and Stephanie was not down for any of the stuff her husband was doing in his locked basement, right? So she went to see a lawyer to reveal all the dirty stuff she'd found in the basement, including a devil costume and several dildos. But the lawyer wasn't the only one she told, because remember, Stephanie was extroverted. She liked to gossip. She liked attention. Around this time, Jay Smith was continuing his weird monologues over the school's PA system every morning, and they were getting more bizarre and lasting longer. Also around this time, the local police were getting calls from business owners in the town. Apparently, J.C. Smith had a bit of a shoplifting problem, and multiple store owners had witnessed him lifting their merchandise, but the whole sordid affair was kept quiet because Jay was considered a master educator and a prominent member of society. In the mid-1970s, Jay's wife Stephanie was given the unfortunate diagnosis of terminal cancer, so that may have contributed to Jay Smith getting away with shoplifting because everyone knew that his wife was dying and they felt bad for him and they kind of assumed he was acting out, you know, behaving in ways he normally wouldn't if he wasn't crushed by grief and confusion. But in the middle of Stephanie's battle with cancer, when she was in and out of the hospital and hooked up to tubes, the Smith's oldest daughter came back home, trying to find a better path in life. Jay Smith's daughter Stephanie had gotten married to a man named Edward Hunsberger in 1977. They were both addicted to heroin, they both were jobless because of this addiction, and so Stephanie became a sex worker in Philly to finance their drug habit. Things were not going well, and Edward had landed himself in some legal trouble, having been convicted of armed robbery in 1975. So, in September of 1977, the couple decided to leave Philly and go back to King of Prussia, moving in with Stephanie's parents, hoping for a fresh start in a brighter future. 
Edward was on probation, and he was required to keep in touch with his parole officer, and both Stephanie and Edward had started getting treatment for their addiction. So you would think that Stephanie trying to turn her life around by moving in with her parents, the people who should have been the most motivated to see her succeed, it would be a positive thing, but it ended up being the worst choice she could have made. In the winter of 1977, Stephanie wrote a letter to an old friend where she expressed her concern and paranoia that her father had somehow caused her mother to get cancer. At the very least, he had figured out a way to make her cancer spread from her stomach where it had started to her intestines and lymph nodes. Stephanie wondered if Jay had been putting something in her mother's food, and she wrote, quote, So much cancer in such a short period. No way. I'm afraid I'll kill myself if anything happens. End quote. A few months later, on February 2nd, 1978, Stephanie and her husband Edward paid a visit to Edward's parents, who lived in North Wales. That's just about a 30-minute drive from King of Prussia, Pennsylvania. The Hunsbergers were encouraged when they saw their son, who they obviously worried about constantly. Eddie had been a smart young man who loved to read and learn. He had been looking forward to a bright future before the drugs, but they could see that he was making steps towards getting better, so they were encouraged. Eddie would visit his parents, Dorothy and Pete, at least once a week, and on this day, he'd come to do his taxes. Before he and Stephanie left that day, they told the Hunsbergers that they would be back later, but they didn't come back later. They never came back again. No one saw Stephanie and Edward Hunsberger after February 2nd, 1978, except for one person, Stephanie's father, J.C. Smith. After two weeks of not seeing their son, not being able to contact him, Dorothy Hunsberger began calling everyone she could think of. One of her first calls was to Jay Smith, who she knew the couple had been living with. Jay told Dorothy that Eddie had found out he had a warrant out for his arrest for writing forged prescriptions, so he and Stephanie had decided to go to California and lay low. Dorothy was confused because she had talked to the police and there were no warrants out for her son's arrest, but Jay Smith claimed he knew no more than what he'd been told by his daughter and son-in-law. Another story Jay told was that Stephanie and Edward had gotten in deep with some drug dealers and they didn't have the money to pay their debts, so they had left, hoping the heat would die down. Edward and Stephanie had also made appointments at a local methadone clinic in February of 1978, and when they didn't show, the clinic called the house and got Jay Smith on the phone. Jay told the clinic that he'd gotten a hold of some Placidil, which is a medication that's traditionally used for insomnia, but in high doses, it can cause unconsciousness. Jay also said he'd gotten some really good pot, and Edward and Stephanie were going to detox themselves. The clinic counselor was like, I don't really know if that's a good idea. You know, they're going through treatment, like there's a plan here. And Jay was like, thanks for your help that you gave my daughter, but listen, we're all set here. However, what I said about the pot was true. I got some really good pot in Trenton, so if you're ever interested, hit me up. (laughs) The thing was, no one had heard from Eddie and Stephanie besides Jay, not one other person. And the couple had left all their belongings at his house, including their clothes and toothbrushes and, like, identification, you know, important things. A few weeks after first speaking to Jay about the whereabouts of her son, Dorothy Hunsberger got another call from him with the news that Eddie and Stephanie had finally arrived in California. So apparently... Eddie and Stephanie were able to call Jay Smith and update him, but they couldn't or wouldn't call anyone else. Dorothy also reported that she'd gotten a call from Stephanie Smith, Jay's sick wife. And during this call, the two women discussed what they knew about their missing children. And Stephanie said, quote, oh, my God, I hope Jay didn't do them in. End quote. So we have Stephanie Smith, sick, fighting a battle with cancer that she would not win. We have Stephanie Hunsberger, missing along with her husband. And we have Jay Smith, who is about to face his own disappointment. So remember, from part one, Bill Bradfield spent the summer of 1978 in Santa Fe, New Mexico, taking courses at St. John's College and falling in love with a woman named Joanna, while the two Susans stayed behind in Upper Marion, hating each other and fighting over him. Well, before school let out for the summer, at the last faculty meeting of the year, it was announced that after 12 years, J.C. Smith would no longer be the principal at Upper Marion High School. He was going to be moving to the administration building where he would have the title of Special Services Coordinator. 
he would not be taking a pay cut, and the staff were led to believe that this had been his decision, when in reality, Jay's shoplifting had gotten so frequent that the police could no longer ignore it, and the school had to take action. But let's, you know, not give the school too much credit here, because he was the principal for 12 years, and their action wasn't to fire him, it was just to move him to a different area where he would keep the same pay and not really have to face any consequences for his behavior. Now, 99.9% of the faculty at Upper Marion High School were really happy about this decision. The Prince of Darkness would no longer haunt the halls of the school or spend hours rambling on the loudspeaker because no one really had anything positive to say about J.C. Smith, except for one person, Bill Bradfield. He stood up at the staff meeting, the faculty meeting, the last one of the school where they announced this, and he talked for five minutes about how great Jay Smith was and what the school was losing. It was losing its leader, you know, the person who was leading them into battle. He then threw a going away party for Jay Smith, and this confused everyone because no one had thought Bill Bradfield and Jay Smith were close. Sure, they'd often been spotted out together, but each time they claimed it was just a fluke, that they just happened to be in the same place at the same time, and it hadn't been planned. So the following August of 1978, while Bill Bradfield was boating and philandering in New Mexico, Jay Smith got arrested. This shit is crazy. So pay close attention because I'm about to throw a lot of information at you, right? It was August 19th, a humid Saturday night. A young couple were sitting on a curb in the Gateway Shopping Center eating slices of pizza when they witnessed a brown Ford Granada slowly pull into the parking lot of the shopping center and park next to a van. A man got out of the Ford Granada and began looking into the windows of the van, and that was when the couple saw that this man was tall. He also appeared to have like a large hood over his head and face, and he was holding a gun in each hand. Obviously, they were terrified. They literally crawled away as to not attract his attention and called the police from a payphone. A radio broadcast went out with a description of the car this hooded armed man had been driving, and within just a few minutes, the brown Ford Granada was spotted, driving erratically and heading south in the northbound traffic lane. The police pursued this vehicle and were able to get it to stop at the Route 202 on-ramp at Valley Forge Road. Remember, Jay Smith lives on Valley Forge Road. The person driving the vehicle was former Upper Marion High School principal and the Prince of Darkness himself, J.C. Smith. Within moments, the police saw that Jay had a 22 Ruger in the car with him, and he was promptly arrested before the officers began to search his car, and they found some stuff. A black leather pouch on the front seat that held four loaded handguns, a sleeve from a football jersey that had been fashioned into a hood mask, a bolt cutter, along with other tools that police knew were commonly used to break into cars. There was also an oil filter with two bullet holes in the top, which only made sense once the police saw that the 22 Ruger's front sight had been filed off, and there was a cylinder of rubber on the barrel which fit perfectly into the oil filter, which, as it turns out, had been made into a homemade silencer. Two syringes were found, one in the car and one in Jay's pocket, and these syringes held Placido, the same substance Jay had told the methadone clinic that he had gotten to help his daughter Stephanie detox. In this form and this volume that Jay Smith had it in, it would cause unconsciousness within a minute of injection. Speaking of Stephanie Hunsberger, her social security card was also found in Jay's car. In the back seat and trunk of the car, there were black plastic trash bags along with a blue plaid jacket that had rolls of strapping tape in the pockets along with a pair of gloves. Jay would later claim that the Placidil was not his. It belonged to his daughter and her husband. But who's in his pocket in his car? And they'd been missing for like six months. J.C. Smith was booked into jail, and around midnight, one of the police officers who was walking by the booking area overheard Jay on the phone whispering to someone. He said, quote, Even before the bail bondsmen get over to the house and take everything out, including the files, end quote. Okay, so obviously the police are thinking that there's going to be some good stuff at Jay's house if he's trying to get someone to clear the place out before law enforcement could get there. So the arresting officer alerted detectives. They drove right over to Jay's home on Valley Forge Road to see exactly who had been instructed to tamper with evidence. And they got there a little before 1 a.m. and waited. They didn't have to wait for very long. Less than an hour later, a car pulled into Jay Smith's driveway and a man emerged that the police described as short, slight, and resembling Woody Allen. This guy ended up being an out-of-work school librarian with 
four college degrees who'd been a close friend of Jay's for years. The detectives, uh, they let him do the heavy lifting. They didn't make their presence known until he had gone back and forth from Jay Smith's basement to his car and loaded like tons and tons of boxes in. And once he'd secured the last box, law enforcement emerged and they were like, thanks, we'll take those now. Police went into the basement and found that the walls were riddled with bullet holes. And the contents of Jay's secret basement were even more shocking than the contents of his car. 818 grams of marijuana. All right, so a gram is usually like two nuggets. And in 2021, a gram can cost anywhere from 5 to 15 bucks. Depends how good the weed is. I don't know how much it would cost in the 70s, right? But let's just say that's a lot of weed. That's like two pounds. But get this. Inside the basement, the police found an additional 580 grams, along with some contraband pills and capsules, as well as prescription drugs such as Valium. There was also equipment recovered that Jay had stolen from Upper Marion High School, including reproductions of famous paintings that had been hanging on the walls of the school before he had stolen them. Jay Smith had also taken four gallons of nitric acid from the school. There were latex gloves, five more homemade silencers, a bunch of blue combs with the name of Jay's Army Reserve Unit printed on them, a bunch of swingers magazines, both straight and gay, a collection of chains and locks, and a whole lot of books with titles like The Canine Tongue, Her Bestial Dreams, and Her Four-Legged Lover. Later, Jay's wife Stephanie would also give her lawyer two dildos. Um, One was pink. And one was extra large, black, and had a manual crank that squirted water. But the items found that mainly added to Jay Smith's legal troubles were a bunch of stolen Army ID cards. Several guns registered using the identification of a teacher at Upper Marion High School who had had his wallet stolen out of his desk. Two silver badges and uniforms like a security guard would wear. And a fake Brinks security guard ID card that bore the name Carl S. Williams, but also had a picture of J.C. Smith on it. The uniforms and the fake Brinks ID, they were important because the prior year there'd been a couple of robberies of Sears stores in that area perpetrated by someone pretending to be a Brinks security guard. The first one had happened on August 27, 1977 at the Sears store in St. David's near Villanova College. It was around 1.50 in the afternoon when the clerk saw a Brinks security courier walk in, so she grabbed the day's deposits, totaling $34,000 in cash, and the courier signed the logbook as Carl S. Williams before leaving with the money. Then five minutes later, the real courier, the real Brinks security guard, showed up. It happened again on December 17th at the Sears in the Nashimini Mall in Ben Salem, Pennsylvania. But this time, the clerks had been warned to watch out for fraudulent couriers, and when the Brinks security guard approached to take the money, the clerk asked for his identification card, and then she took it into the back office to compare the name and signature with a list of verified couriers and their signatures. The name on the ID was Albert J. Wharton, which was a verified courier, but the signature did not match, so this smart clerk walked back out and asked the courier if he'd brought their money. She said the store was short on coins and $1 bills because of the busy holiday seasons right around Christmas, and they'd ordered some from Brinks. The courier told her, you know, no, I don't have that. It's been a very, very busy day. Your money will be arriving on a different truck. And the clerk was like, no, no. She knew that this was not protocol. I think she'd worked there something like eight years, and they never did that, like, sent money on different trucks than the one who was picking up the money. So she went back to the office and she put out a call on the mall's speaker for security. And she figured because she was using a code, not calling for security directly, the fake security guard wouldn't notice that anything was amiss, but he did. He kind of got real nervous. He started sweating. And then he ran past the counter into the back office, demanding his identification card back and reprimanding the clerk for treating him in this disrespectful way. And then he grabbed the identification card out of her hand and he ran away, pushing people as he went and hurtling down the escalator. So obviously he knew he got caught, right? But he didn't want her to be able to keep the identification because it's a fake name, but it's his picture. So Jay Smith was school principal during the week and a con man on the weekends. The police also found out that someone had been cashing welfare checks sent out to Stephanie and Edward Hunsberger, and this had been going on for six months, the same amount of time that the couple had been MIA. 
What are the odds? These checks had been sent to Jay Smith's home, and the signatures on them were forged. Even though Jay's wife Stephanie had discovered her own dirty secrets about her husband, she initially took a a kind of stand-by-your-man stance, hiring a local lawyer named John O'Brien to represent Jay. But we also know that Stephanie loved to talk. And before her husband had been in jail for a week, she'd given a press conference spilling all the tea to the press and the public who were hungry for details about this school principal turned criminal. Stephanie told reporters, quote, Hon, you can live with a man for 27 years and not know him. Why, Jay didn't even let me know he was in jail till 36 hours after the arrest. I was shocked. I hadn't seen Jay since Saturday, and I thought he'd went to the Army Reserves or something. He would always come and go without telling me nothing. It wasn't unusual not to see him for days at a time. He's such a thinker, you know? He never talked much around the house, but he'd go down to his den and speak into his tape recorder. Hun, he has a wonderful speaking voice, but he always said I didn't own him, and I shouldn't get involved in his life, and he wanted his privacy. I was always taught that a man is the master of the house, and you just accept what he wants. End quote. Stephanie said her husband had some eccentric ways, and he would often say that uh, the devil was going to rule the earth. (laughs) So while J.C. Smith is in Chester County Farms Prison trying to get bail, he got a letter from Bill Bradfield. And Bill basically said, listen, I'm so sorry that this happened to you. I send my regrets. Let me know if you need anything. In August of 1978, Jay sent a letter back to Bill telling him not to be so formal because he'd addressed the letter uh, Dr. Smith. Jay was like, you can call me Jay or Jack. That's what my friends call me, and I consider you a friend. Jay also asked Bill if he could send him some books while he was behind bars because he wanted to teach other prisoners. He asked for Moby Dick, Ivan Hall, and Warner's Grammar. Writing letters to Bill wasn't all Jay was doing. He was also writing to the press, giving his side of the story. He denied being involved in any criminal activity. He said that it was ridiculous to believe that he could possibly be robbing Sears stores, pretending to be a courier. And this was probably just another instance of the school administrators who were out to get him. About the other bizarre items found in his house, like the animal books and the swingers paraphernalia, Jay Smith said this. Quote, the police found a collection of special books that I keep for research, but because they deal with such subjects as sex, homosexuality, and bestiality, the police seem preoccupied with them. They see the books on homosexuality and they say, aha, Smith's a homosexual. So they ask my wife and she sets them straight and they scratch that one from their list, end quote. Jay said that these books and materials were not for his own use. They were for, like, academic research. He was planning to write a book titled How to Prevent Homosexuality in Your Children, and as far as the dog books were concerned, he'd been exploring the possibility of training animals to become sexual surrogates for people in order to save their marriages. In reality, the police weren't overly concerned with Jay Smith's sexual proclivities, even though they did have a great time cracking jokes about it in the station. They were more concerned with the whereabouts of Stephanie and Eddie Hunsberger and the possible connection of the massive amounts of Placidil found in the possession of Jay Smith. They were also worried about the Sears robbery and the attempted Sears robbery. So it was like fun to joke about all the crazy things they'd found in Jay Smith's house, but that wasn't his issue. Stephanie Smith, Jay's wife, was also keeping a running log of her thoughts about her husband in a diary that she wrote in while undergoing treatment for her cancer. By this time, Jay had made bail and was back home, but his wife noticed he was hardly ever home. He would be out all night long, and she had no idea where he was or who he was with. Kind of sounds like Bill Bradfield, am I right? Both of these men are just like out all night, with no explanation. I wonder if they were together, like planning something, maybe. Susan Reynard was also talking about the sudden arrest of her former principal along with the rest of Upper Marion High. You know, everyone was talking about it. But in a letter to her psychologist dated September 3rd, Susan said, quote, Our former principal, Dr. Smith, has been arrested on robbery charges. The papers have been full of bizarre stories, so I'm sure the opening of school will be interesting. I always thought he was strange, but not criminal, end quote. 
By the start of the 1978 fall semester, dynamics were changing. Bill Bradfield was back from his summer of fun in Santa Fe, but his Pennsylvania posse, which included Sue Myers and Vince Valatis, they were still feeling neglected by him as they fought to keep the arts and craft store from going bankrupt. Days would go by with sales as low as 5 or $10.00. But when they did talk to Bill, he was nothing but rainbows and sunshine about the prospects of that store. And he even talked about opening a second and a third location and possibly, like, franchising Terraform. Bill insisted that the store stay open, and Sue Myers slowly had to pull herself away from her actual job as a teacher to devote more time to the arts and crafts store. Vince was no longer invited to the apartment for dinner and long talks because Bill and Sue weren't really together that often. Bill would stay out all night long. Then he would come home the next morning looking exhausted as if he hadn't slept at all. The entourage was fractured and Sue and Bill walked around like they were strangers to each other. So she wasn't surprised when Bill told her in October that he had to take a trip to Annapolis. The reasons for the trip were twofold. According to Bill, Chris Pappas had damaged a rented sailboat they'd been using over the summer, and Bill needed to personally go there to oversee the repairs of the boat. He also said that his friend Joanna had a VW Beetle she was selling, and he was thinking of buying it. Sue Myers no longer believed a word that Bill said, and she told Vince that she knew he was going there just to see Joanna and spend time with her. Vince, who still had faith in his idol, he told Sue, you know, you're wrong to worry. Bill has transcended beyond feeling sexual desire for anyone. Bill is this elevated being, and he's not concerned with, like, women and sex and, like, all of that. He's just, like, really concerned with just going to the next plane. Shortly before Bill had left for Annapolis, he'd told Vince that he planned to remain celibate until the day he died. <laughs> Sue Myers wasn't the only one who was starting to push back and cut through the bullshit of Bill Bradfield. Apparently, Bill had promised Susan he would go to dinner at her house. He loved her cooking. He said he would never miss it, but he didn't show up or call. So the next day, Susan made a big show of handing a student a plate of leftovers from the dinner that was accompanied by a message. The message said, this is the dinner you failed to get to last night. Obviously, word got around to all the teachers that this had happened, including Vince, so he decided to talk to Susan, hoping to get through to her once and for all that her behavior, her behavior with Bill Bradfield was problematic and she needed to stop being so obsessed with him because it was one-sided. He didn't want to have anything to do with Susan. Bill was just trying to be nice to Susan, just be her friend. And he didn't like her like that, so she needed to just get over it. The conversation that followed caused Vince to believe that Bill was actually right about Susan. She was unhinged and paranoid and didn't have a grasp on reality. Susan told Vince that she knew how close he was to Bill and Sue Myers, but she needed to know that he was still her friend, that he would still be her friend at the end, even though Sue hated her so much. Vince was like, yeah, I'm your friend, and it's not true. Sue doesn't hate you. But Susan pressed on, informing Vince that she truly believed Sue Myers wanted to see Susan and her children hurt. Vince was like, okay, lady, whatever you say, you know? And he made sure to keep his distance from her after that. When he told Bill about the conversation during one of the rare times he, Bill, and Sue Myers were together, Bill volunteered a piece of information that Vince and Sue had never heard before. Bill said he knew for a fact that Susan Reinhardt was dating J.C. Smith the former principal of Upper Marion High School, who was currently out on bail after being accused of a bunch of crazy shit. Bill said that Susan and Jay had pet names for each other. Jay called Susan Tweety Bird. Sue and Vince were shocked because Jay Smith had always been a really heavily disliked person and all the things that had come out about him since his arrest, how could any woman find him attractive? Actually, Vince believed it more than Sue Myers did. And Sue Myers did not like Susan Raynard, right? But even Sue Myers was like, no way, I, I have a hard time believing that. But Bill was like, it's true. Sadly, in October of 1978, Susan Raynard's mother died unexpectedly. But this tragedy gave Susan something she had not experienced in a long time, financial security. Her mother had left both Susan and Susan's older brother, Pat, 
$34,000 in cash each, and Susan had also gotten her mother's wedding ring, which was valued at $1,500. Her brother Pat helped her set everything up so that Pat would be the executor of her estate, and Susan's two children, Karen and Michael, would naturally become the beneficiaries. With some money in the bank, maybe Susan was feeling a bit more confident because she calmly gave Bill Bradfield an ultimatum. Is it going to be Sue Myers or is it going to be me? Make a choice or I'll make it for you. Once again, Bill told Susan that Sue was not stable and he was afraid of what she might do. And Susan was like, okay, so that's your decision. Goodbye then. You know, we're done. Bill tried everything, begging, bargaining, flattery. He said that if Susan could just give him a bit more time, he could figure out a way to get Sue Myers into a relationship with Vince, and then she would no longer be his problem. But Susan Reinhardt would not budge. Finally, Bill gave up and promised Susan he would move out of the apartment that he lived in with Sue Myers and move in with his parents. The first step towards extracting himself from Sue and moving closer to Susan. That was enough for Susan at that point. It was breadcrumbs. It was still empty promises. But Susan was like, all right, if you do move out and I see that you're making an effort, I can be a little bit more accommodating and a little more patient. Susan started telling her friends and her therapist that she and Bill Bradfield would be getting married in the summer of 1979. And after that, they would be leaving the States and taking Karen and Michael to England, where they would live as a family happily ever after. Strangely, Susan still claimed that this all had to be kept secret, especially from Sue Myers and Susan's own ex-husband, Ken, because if Ken found out that she was planning this, he would try to stop her from taking her children when she left. This same month, Susan's alleged fiancé, Bill Bradfield, was behaving very strangely. He began to actually resemble Rasputin more and more. His beard was getting longer and bushier and more tangled. There was like stuff stuck in it like Cheerios and stuff. His icy blue eyes were wild and they would dart around as if looking for potential threats. He would often wake up at night crying and shouting out. He was constantly high, strong, and tense. One morning, Bill woke up on one of the rare occasions he was sleeping in the same bed as Sue Myers, and he told her that he'd had a dream that J.C. Smith was an innocent man. Bill said that Jay couldn't have possibly committed the August Sears robbery because Jay had been with Bill in Ocean City that Saturday. If Jay didn't commit the August robbery, then there was very little chance he'd been responsible for the December attempted robbery. Sue Myers was like, what the hell are you talking about, man? Just woke me up screaming, what are you talking about? And why haven't you mentioned this before? Like, why didn't you tell me or anybody else this before? And Bill was like, well, you know, I I didn't think it was important at the time, but now I need to figure out what to do with this information. In November, Bill and Vince were alone in the car driving, and Bill started talking about J.C. Smith. Bill told Vince that Jay was a hitman for the mafia. He'd killed many people. And now J.C. Smith wanted to kill Susan Reynard because she knew too much about him and about the disappearance of his daughter. Bill said that he believed Jay had chopped up his daughter and her husband and put them in dumpsters around the high school. And when Vince told Bill, like, listen, this is crazy. I'm having a hard time believing this. Bill was like, well... Why do you think Jay needed all that nitric acid that he stole from the school? Why would he have needed all those homemade silencers? You read about it in the papers, all that crazy stuff in his house. What do you think it was all there for? And as Bill brought up more examples to support his, I guess, allegations that J.C. Smith was an assassin, Vince was just sitting there starting to believe it. And once Bill had thoroughly manipulated Vince into believing it, Vince said they needed to go to the police, which is a normal reaction. But Bill was like, no, absolutely. We cannot go to the police. And you have to swear to not tell a soul about this. Because this guy, J.C. Smith, he's a dangerous, like, mafia assassin. Bill reasoned with Vince, and he explained that they didn't have any proof of this. But going to the cops would put them on Hitman Jay's radar, which would cause Jay or his Hitman friends or his mafia friends to go after them and even their families. Bill's plan was to try and keep Jay under control. Uh, you know, like manipulate him, keep him under control, keep him from killing anyone until Bill and Vince had collected enough evidence to prove these allegations. 
Bill also told Sue Myers about Jay wanting to kill Susan Reynard, but he said a kind of different story. He didn't say that Jay was an assassin for the mafia. He was like, I don't know why Jay wants to kill Susan, but he does. He said, all those nights that I've been gone, all those mornings I've come home looking exhausted, you thought I was out cheating on you, but I wasn't. I was with Jay Smith trying to convince him not to kill Susan. It's a full-time job. This guy's got me up all night trying to convince him not to kill Susan. Now, at this point, Bill Bradfield was spending four or five nights away from their apartment. So Sue was like, maybe he's right. Maybe that's what he is doing. One day, Bill brought Sue over to Jay's house to deliver some books. She stayed in the car because she didn't want to see Jay Smith. But when Bill came back, he told her that he believed Jay was innocent of the crimes he'd been arrested for, which is ridiculous because at the same time, he was telling Sue that Jay Smith was a mafia hitman with like an ax to grind with his lover, Susan Reynard, Tweety Bird. But he's also like, Sue, this is just tearing me up. I don't know what to do about it. Like an innocent man is being charged with these crimes. What do I do? And it's like ridiculous because you're saying he's innocent of robberies. He's innocent of like posing as a brink security guard, but he's a hitman who's killed people before and is going to kill Susan. So what exactly are we talking about here, Bill? And you know, Sue brought this up. Sue brought this up. So did Vince. And Bill was like, listen, guys, that's not my business. It's not my business to say what he's guilty for or what he's not guilty for. It's my business to show when he's not guilty for something that he's being accused of. The rest of it, it's not my problem. But it, you're making it your problem because you're saying that you're trying to keep this guy from killing Susan Reynard. Wouldn't it be easier to just let him go to jail for the Sears robbery so that he can't kill Susan Reynard and then you wouldn't have to spend five nights a week like staying up with him and having the you can't kill Susan Reynard talk every night? Like, Wouldn't that be easier? Because that's not what was happening, right? Bill Bradfield was not trying to convince J.C. Smith to not kill Susan. He was trying to convince him of something else, in my opinion. But could it be that Bill was setting a narrative? Could it be that Bill Bradfield had made a deal with Jay? Maybe like, uh, you know, I'll give you an alibi for the Sears robbery in August. I'll say you were with me if you help me deal with uh, my little Susan Raynard problem. I mean, I don't know. I'm just speculating. You know, I'm just speculating. I do know, however, that Sue Myers took a peek in Bill's diary around this time, and she claims that he wrote the words, I would like to kill Susan Reynard. So just just spitballing, just guessing here, though. It was not long after this trip to Jay Smith's house and the ultimatum conversation with Susan Reynard that Bill presented Sue Myers with a cohabitation agreement. Sue had been with Bill long enough to know that he had a reason for everything he did. So she asked him why. Why, after living together for five years, after being together for over a decade, did he want her to sign this now? And Bill said that he was afraid of Susan Reynard. In her obsession with him, she had named him as a beneficiary on her life insurance. Now, why was this a bad thing? Well, Bill had been telling Sue and Vince for weeks that Jay Smith wanted to kill Susan Reynard. And if Jay happened to succeed in killing Susan, the microscope might be turned on the person who was listed on Susan's life insurance, which would be him. Sue was like, okay, that's weird, but once again, what does that have to do with me and this cohabitation agreement? And Bill was like, listen, signing this agreement will protect you from any legal battles that I might encounter with Susan's next of kin in the event that she is murdered. But none of it really made any sense because... Bill also told Sue that if something did happen to Susan, he wouldn't take any money. So why would there be a legal battle if Bill wouldn't take any money? Sue actually consulted a lawyer. Thank God she was smart enough to not sign this. And this lawyer was like, this agreement's ludicrous. Don't go signing anything that this guy gives you. This is absolutely ridiculous. So she didn't sign it. During the weekend of Thanksgiving, Bill warned Sue Myers that she should get out of town because Jay Smith usually killed on holidays. And Bill himself left town and traveled to Boston, where he spent the weekend with Joanna Atkin, who was now a student at Harvard. When Bill had approached Sue with that cohabitation agreement, he had not been listed on any life insurance policies. But that would soon change. In December, Susan Reynard called the USAA insurance company and requested a $500,000 life insurance policy, and the person she named as the beneficiary was William Bradfield. At this time, her request was denied. The insurance company felt that half a million dollars would over-insure her life, which when I was researching this and I read that, I was like super offended for her 
because that's rude. Can you imagine if you, you know, you call a life insurance company, you're trying to get life insurance and you're like, hey, I want a policy for this much. And they're like, yeah, you're not actually worth that much. Like your life isn't worth that much. So it's a no from us, dog. Like, could you imagine how insulting? Oh, it pisses me off. I hate insurance companies. Anyways, she tries to get this policy. They say no. But Susan wasn't going to let it lie there. She wasn't going to take no for an answer or more accurately, I should say that Bill Bradfield wasn't going to let her take no for an answer. And that is where we will end today's video. But I'm sure you can see where this is headed. Although you can probably predict why Susan Reinhart may have been killed and you may think you know what's coming, you really have no idea. It just gets, it gets crazier, it gets crazier. It's just bananas. Oh my gosh, like I'm sorry also if I embarrass some of y'all today with these spicy like letters. <laughs> I embarrassed myself too. Like it's already hot in here and I felt my cheeks getting real rosy. But uh, yeah, it gets it gets spicier, guys. Okay, so stay tuned for part three. Join me for part three. Thank you so much for being here. Don't forget to subscribe if you haven't already. If you already did subscribe, make sure you still are subscribed because YouTube likes to unsubscribe people from my channel all the time, probably because they think at this point that I'm some like ASMR porn channel that just reads like dirty letters out loud. It's probably why they're unsubscribing people, to be honest. Don't forget to hit the like button if you liked it. Share the video if you think it's worth sharing. Comment. Let me know what you're thinking about this so far. Also, don't forget to follow my podcast, Crime Weekly, that I co-host with Derek Levasseur, who's a retired police detective, also a Big Brother winner. And we put out new episodes every Friday wherever you get your podcasts. And on Wednesday, they go out on YouTube. So I'll put the links in the description box. Thank you so much to my patrons. Thank you so much to everybody for being here. I know some people don't like multi-parters, but I promise it's going to be worth it in the end. Stay kind, stay beautiful, and stay safe, and I will see you very, very soon. Bye. I got blood